Welcome to Blue Crane Digital's introduction to the Nikon D80 Digital SLR training DVD. Since its introduction, the D80 has been embraced by thousands of photographers. Why would someone consider buying this camera? The answer is simple, to take better photographs. But remember, this is just a tool. It may have great optics, it may store a large amount of information, but the quality of the image is really determined by the operator, you. We're going to simplify this complex piece of equipment and give you the freedom to take the types of pictures you want. This presentation is not designed to replace your camera manual. It's designed to focus on the most important features and controls of the camera. Manuals are not designed to teach you how to shoot great photos. Instead, they are technical descriptions of how the camera components work. Your manual won't show you what the engineers had in mind when they finalized the layouts of the buttons and decided how things should work together. Compare the camera manual to the owner's guide in the glove box of your car. You wouldn't dream of teaching yourself to drive just by reading it, would you? Think of this presentation as a mini driver's education class for your camera. We've broken this presentation down into small, easy to understand sections. First, we'll discuss a structure for using the camera. For many of you, this single topic will revolutionize the way you think about photography. Next, we'll demystify the camera and the photo taking process. We'll cover topics that define the quality of your photos. Following camera operation, we'll discuss composition and why it's important. Finally, we'll look at the settings in the shooting menu and custom settings menu that allow you to tailor the camera functions to your shooting style. Don't worry if you don't grasp the advanced features the first time you watch this presentation. Use your new D80 for a few weeks and these topics will make a lot more sense. Before we begin, here's a tip that can make learning this camera easier. The D80 comes with a manual that's small enough to fit in your camera bag. Finding specific topics can be difficult. For me, the manual is more useful when it's larger and easier to read. If you register your camera online, Nikon will allow you to download and print the manual from its support website in PDF format. Since the file is in PDF format, you'll need Adobe Reader to open it. Next, select the File Print option from your browser. In the Printer dialog box, select Fit to Printer Margins. This will allow you to print a larger copy of the manual. You can either print the manual single-sided or double-sided, as I've shown here. So let's get started. In a little over an hour, you'll have the skills you need to take better photos. If you're moving up to a digital SLR from a point-and-shoot camera, all the buttons and menus may seem like a jumble. The layout of the controls may not look intuitive, and the entire camera may seem like a bewildering series of choices. New users of the D80 can become overwhelmed by all the selections available, especially in this LCD monitor. Using the custom settings menu allows you to set up the camera in millions of combinations. Here is the first thing you need to know. You usually don't have to look at the LCD monitor to get great photos. Most of these settings are for fine-tuning or for personal preferences. Once you master a few concepts and controls, all these settings will make logical sense. We'll cover them in the advanced section of this presentation. First, let's look at a point-and-shoot camera. The engineers who designed it had one procedure in mind. They wanted you to react to a photo opportunity by turning on the camera, raising it to your eye, and snapping a photo. Compare the point and shoot approach to making instant oatmeal. You're hungry. You open a packet of instant cereal and add water. 60 seconds later, you have a consistent, if uninspiring, meal. It may not make your heart race, but it does what it's designed to do. Cooking from scratch is another matter altogether. Many cooks are passionate about their food because the process leads to a result that is more satisfying. This is the same way we want you to think about approaching your camera. Rather than reacting to hunger, the cook anticipates that a meal will be served in several hours. First, he reviews the recipe. We'll call this first activity, setup. 
Next, he stages the correct ingredients necessary to complete the dish. He creates a situation that will allow the process to succeed. Third, he prepares and assembles the ingredients for the desired result, including taste, texture, and temperature. Because these steps are unique to this dish, we call this step subject. Fourth and last, he double checks the temperature, sets the timer, and puts the dish in the oven. We'll call this step the shot. By thinking ahead, the accomplished cook minimizes stress and mistakes. He maximizes his chance of delivering the product he originally had in mind. If you ever have the chance to follow a professional photographer around, the first thing you will notice is the camera has already been set up for the current shooting situation. This means that the photographer is spending his time and energy seeing the subject, making decisions about composition and exposure, and making active choices to get the desired image. The professional won't be looking at the dials or menus, trying to locate the correct control, or trying to change a setting before the moment disappears. If you adopt the structure we're about to describe, neither will you. In order to gain control of the camera, you have to prepare it before you go out to shoot. So you review the menus and custom settings first. Will the current settings complement the situation you are likely to encounter when you get to the shooting location? If you haven't used the camera for a week or so, reacquaint yourself with the controls on the outside of the camera. This first step gets your camera 90% of the way toward taking great photos. Make this task a habit, a ritual if you will, and you'll greatly simplify the settings to be managed when you get to your destination. Just like the cook reviewing his recipe, these are settings you will review long before you are ready for the shot. We call this step of our ritual, Setup. It not only allows you to review all the settings on the menus and dials, it also gets your mind actively engaged in the process you are about to perform, capturing great images you can share with your friends and family. The second part of the ritual begins when you get to your destination. Look at the light. Is it sunny? Are you indoors or outdoors? This will determine your ISO speed and white balance settings. We need the single frame or continuous shooting mode. Do you want the lens to continually focus or do you plan to shoot stationary objects? You can review all the settings you need for this situation in the control panel. You won't need to look at the monitor for a single thing. Because you are outside on a sunny day, set the white balance to direct sunlight. Next, confirm the ISO is set to 100 since there is plenty of daylight. Unless the situation changes, you won't have to look at these settings again, regardless of what you decide to shoot. Now you are ready to pick out a subject to photograph. The camera is 95% ready to capture the image you want. Check to be sure the camera is set for single frame shooting. Finally, make sure the camera will meter using 3D matrix. Once you determine what you want to shoot and you review these few controls, you shouldn't have to take your eyes off the subject at all. All the settings will be things that you set by feel either before you look or while you are looking through the viewfinder. You should ask yourself a couple of questions in succession before you frame the shot. Where do you want the camera to focus? Is there anything moving in the frame that you want to freeze, like an animal or running water? What is the relationship you want to create between the subject and the background? While looking at the subject through the viewfinder, you can set the camera to accomplish your objectives, making the changes by feel. Most of the camera's controls, like AE lock and depth of field preview, are either turned on by pressing a button or off by default. Last, select an aperture value that gives you the depth of field you want, with a shutter fast enough to get a sharp image. That's it. If you are actively involved and ready to take the photograph when the moment presents itself, you greatly increase your chances of capturing a compelling image. Don't worry if you didn't understand everything we just covered. 
During the rest of the presentation, we'll go over all the buttons, dials, and settings. But everything we discuss relates back to you developing your own ritual for taking photos. Once you're done watching this presentation, come back to this section. You'll be ready to begin constructing your own ritual for setup, situation, subject, and executing the shot. Before we change any settings on the camera, we need to check out the viewfinder. Look through the viewfinder and adjust the diopter dial until the focus brackets come into clear view. I know this seems obvious, but if this adjustment is off, you won't see the best image through the lens. Your eyes will strain to see the composition. If you share your D80 with someone, you'll want to check the diopter every time you prepare for a photo shoot. Remember the four-part structure we just went over? As we cover the camera controls, we'll proceed backwards through our structure. We'll start with the controls for the shot first. At the end, we'll cover the setup of the camera. Although you'll perform your ritual in the order we described, the camera is easier to learn if we explore it from the inside out. Turn the mode dial to auto and look closely at the display inside the viewfinder. These settings control the qualities of an individual image. They directly relate to the fourth step of our ritual, the shot. Now set the camera on M for manual exposure. Look through the viewfinder and hold the shutter release halfway down. You'll see new displays at the bottom of the viewfinder which were not visible when the camera was on auto. Around the center of the screen are 11 focus area brackets. The red bracket indicates where the camera is focusing. On the left side we see the focus indicator. If the indicator is not visible or is blinking steadily, then the camera is having a problem with focusing. This usually happens in low light situations or when an object is too close to the lens. Just to the right are icons for flash value lock and auto exposure lock. As we mentioned before, these settings are turned on and off with a button just before we're ready to shoot. Along the bottom, you'll see an icon for auto ISO. Next, we'll see the shutter speed. Here, the shutter will open and close in 1 60th of a second. This shutter speed indicates the shutter will fire in 1 1 25th of a second. Longer exposures, approaching a second or more, are indicated with this double tick display. Just to the right is the aperture display. A smaller number indicates an open aperture. A larger number indicates the aperture is closed down. We'll cover both shutter speed and aperture in more detail later. Next to the aperture setting is the electronic analog exposure display. If there are no bars to the left or right of the zero indicator, the camera can take a properly exposed photo with the current settings. However, if bars appear to the right of the zero indicator, the photo will be underexposed. If you see bars to the left, the picture will be overexposed. You don't have to worry about this yet. I just wanted to introduce it now. Just to the right of the exposure display are the flash compensation and exposure compensation indicators. Below these, you'll find icons for the battery and bracketing. Moving to the right, you'll see a number in brackets indicating how many photos can be stored on the SD card. Press the shutter release halfway down, and the indicator changes, displaying the number of images that can be taken in continuous shooting mode. We'll cover the setting for single frame versus continuous shooting later. Finally, there is the flash ready indicator. This icon appears when the built-in flash is raised, charged, and ready to go. Most of the information displayed in the viewfinder also appears on the camera's control panel. The control panel is split into two large cells and one small cell. Creating a sort of triangle from the top left, you'll see details on how the camera is set for the shot. If the camera is set on auto ISO, it will appear in the corner. Going to the right, you'll see the settings for shutter speed and aperture size. Underneath is the bracketing indicator, followed by the exposure compensation and flash exposure compensation indicators, plus whether you're in flexible program mode and which flash mode is set. The bottom right cell contains information pertaining to the shooting situation. Here you will find the white balance setting, the selected focus bracket, the focus mode,
metering mode, and the shooting mode. This is also where you'll find the shots remaining display. The last cell at the bottom left pertains to your setup ritual. This is where you'll look to check the image quality and size. This is a lot of information. Happily, the Nikon D80 can do a lot of work for you, making sure you get a perfectly balanced exposure in virtually every setting. Don't worry about understanding shutter speed, aperture size, or any of the other settings yet. We'll cover them all very soon. Now that we have seen the viewfinder display, you might be tempted to jump into all the uses for the buttons and menus, but you would miss the real power of this camera. The secret to getting the most out of this camera is the mechanical buttons and switches, like this one, on the body of the camera. They are designed to be used by touch, so you can change the camera settings without ever taking your eye away from the viewfinder. There are five of these buttons in all. Let's look at the simplest one right now. It's called the Focus Selector Lock. It locks the current focus area and disables the multi-selector. The Focus Selector Lock is located in a perfect place to be controlled by your right thumb when you are holding the camera by its grip. Simply lock the focus area in place by moving this slider down. Push the slider back up, bringing the bar and dot together to engage the multi-selector. Now you can select a new focus area bracket. More importantly, you will always know the current setting and will be able to change it without looking at the control. Since there are only two settings, your thumb instantly communicates whether the lock is on or off. The Depth of Field Preview button is another important control you can access by touch. It's located on the front of the camera just below the lens. We'll explain the concept of Depth of Field and how it can improve the composition of your images later in the presentation. Just know that this control will help ensure you get the exact shot you intended. Now look on the other side of the lens, at the Focus Mode Selector. This small switch allows you to set the camera on autofocus or to focus manually. With practice, you'll be able to switch from autofocus to manual focus quickly without pulling away from your subject and possibly losing your shot. You may find this function useful if you are shooting in macro and the camera focuses on a different subject than you wanted. Just switch to manual, turn the focus ring on the lens and get the shot you want. Or say you are shooting photos of the setting sun from a tripod. The focus is correct, but as the light dies down, the camera loses focus lock. Switch to manual focus and you can continue shooting the sunset. Experiment with this on your own. You might be surprised at how many times you'll need manual focus. It's just one more tool that you can use to get an extraordinary shot in difficult lighting. The fourth button to consider is the function button. Were you to push it now, the camera would display the current ISO setting in the viewfinder and on the control panel. But the real power of this button is you can program it to change one of eight other settings. Choose the setting that you use most frequently. We'll go over how to program the function button in our section on the camera's custom settings. The exposure compensation button follows the same principle of setting by touch. From the shutter release, your finger just slides back to the exposure compensation button while you bring your thumb up to turn the main command dial. You can watch the exposure compensation level changing in the viewfinder. Exposure compensation is a tool that professional photographers use all the time. It makes sense then that the designers put it in such a convenient spot. We will go into more detail on what these settings mean and what the engineers were thinking when they designed the D80 later in the presentation. Now let's look at the settings that can help you control the qualities of the image. We'll start here. This mode dial is where you turn your camera on full automatic control and forget it. A generation of film photographers never changed this setting, but we're going to. First, we'll divide the selections into groups so they make more sense. When you set the camera on auto, it does four things for you. It focuses the lens, then it meters the amount of light and the distance to your subject. It sets the aperture or size of the lens opening, then it sets the shutter speed. You snap the photo, you get an average exposure. 
Nikon expanded on this theme with the settings on this side of the dial, called the Digital Vary Programs. For the portrait setting, the aperture is more open for a shorter depth of field. This keeps the subject in focus, but blurs the background for a more pleasing composition. For landscapes, the camera is preset with a small aperture to help keep everything in focus, while the shutter is set fast enough to eliminate a blurred image. The close-up setting assumes you'll be taking photographs of small objects, like plants or insects. For the sports setting, a fast shutter speed is locked in to freeze the subject. Night landscape gives you a very slow shutter to take beautiful shots after dark. The flash is turned off. And for night portraits, the flash mechanism fires to correctly illuminate the subject, and the shutter stays open long enough to illuminate the background. Just think of these settings as flavors of automatic. You'll get slightly less average photos, but still average. Nikon has done a great job of giving you settings that will usually be close to what you want. You can use these settings anytime to get clear photographs. While the camera does a great job anticipating your needs in the digital very programs and auto, you may run into problems if you don't understand how the camera picks its focus area. For now, set the mode dial to auto. On the control panel, you'll see a box that contains 11 small plus signs. This display indicates that the camera will consider the entire frame and choose a subject for focus. For many situations, this may be okay, but if the camera picks the wrong subject, the resulting photo will be out of focus. Next, change the exposure setting to P. The camera will now focus on an object behind one of the 11 focus area brackets. Look through the viewfinder and use the multi-selector on the back of the camera to pick a focus bracket. This will depend on where you decide the most important subject is located. Just taking control of this one function and deciding where you want the camera to focus will result in consistently better photographs. We'll come back to the subject of focus in the advanced section. There, we'll cover the use of focus with other features in the camera. Before we learn how to change settings, you need to know how to reset the camera to the default settings. It's frustrating when you're ready to shoot and you discover the camera settings are incorrect. This is likely to happen if you share your D80 with someone. Reset the camera and you always have a consistent starting point. To reset the camera's outside controls and buttons, simultaneously hold down the AF and exposure compensation buttons for two or three seconds. Each has a green dot on the camera body for quick reference. When the control panel flashes, settings like exposure compensation, bracketing, and white balance are returned to the camera defaults. We'll cover custom settings and how to reset them later. For now, just understand that the two button reset can quickly get you back to a consistent starting point. Let's look at this setting next. It's labeled S for Shutter Priority Auto. Remember how auto meters the available light and selects the shutter speed and aperture? This setting is just one small step away. The camera still meters the light. You decide how long the shutter stays open and the camera picks the correct aperture for a properly exposed photograph. If the shutter time is short, the aperture is more open to let in more light. A longer shutter makes the camera close down the aperture, letting in less light for a longer period. Whichever you choose, the camera will compensate. In this setting, the main command dial controls the shutter. Hold the shutter button halfway down to focus. Then, move the dial to the left or right to get the desired shutter speed. If the words high or low appear in the viewfinder, then the shutter time you selected is either too short or too long for a properly exposed image. Turn the main command dial in the opposite direction. Now, the camera can take a properly exposed photo. Spend a couple of minutes adjusting the shutter. Pause this presentation and come back after you've checked this out. When would we use shutter priority? Here's one example. This photo was taken with a short shutter speed. The water is frozen in time. By making the shutter stay open longer, the quality of the water changes. 
With the shutter priority setting, you can decide what you want your image to communicate. Why else would you use shutter priority? Shooting sporting events where fast shutter speeds are critical is a common reason. But wait, doesn't this camera have a sports setting? Yes, it does. But remember, the camera doesn't know the situation. For instance, freezing a dog in mid-splash may require a different shutter speed than a race car. Rather than use an average setting and risk taking an average photo, you can take control of your images. The amount of light entering the camera is controlled by the aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye. In low light, your pupil gets larger, so you can take in more light. Inside the viewfinder, the aperture is displayed as the number just to the right of the shutter speed. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So, f4 is a larger opening than f11, which is a larger opening than f22. One of the main contributors to controlling the depth of field in a photograph is the size of the aperture when the photograph is taken. I want you to try a little experiment. It's the one thing that will really help you understand the importance of depth of field. First, go to a table in your house. Set a small object, like a salt shaker, on the front edge. Next, place another object, like a pepper mill, in the middle of the table. Finally, place a third object on the back edge. Make sure all three are lined up in a row, like we've shown here. Now, get your face down at tabletop level and concentrate your vision on that pepper mill. Look at the details in the mill itself. Once you are focused on the pepper mill, the other two objects still will be in view. Don't focus on them. Focus on the pepper mill. Do you perceive the other objects to be blurry or slightly out of focus? Yes. This is the way our eyes see and our mind perceives the world. We concentrate on those things that are important. If we can make the camera mimic this visual experience, we can influence how someone viewing our photographs will react or feel. Now, step back and look at the whole table. Without concentrating on any one object, you perceive that all three objects are there, but you really don't notice the detail in any one of them. How would it be if we, as the photographer, decide what's important to look at? Painters have been doing this for hundreds of years. The artist decides where you focus your attention. It may be a face. It may be an orange on a table. It may be everything. But the difference between a snapshot and an artistic photograph is having the tools that enable us to make choices. We'll discuss composition later. But for now, let's concentrate on controlling this thing called depth of field. Many of you know all about depth of field. Your old 35mm film camera did the same thing. The only problem is few of us ever spent the thousands of dollars in film and processing costs necessary to learn how to get the most out of the camera. Instead, most film shooters turn their cameras on full auto control. So we ended up with a lot of people taking snapshots on very expensive gear capable of doing so much more. Then the digital age came along and with it affordable digital cameras. At last we could take all the photos we wanted and review them instantly. We could take more if we didn't like the results. But go back and look at all those digital images you took with your point and shoot digital camera. Everything is in focus. We are taking digital snapshots. There was minimal control of depth of field. Why? Digital point and shoot cameras focus the image on a tiny image sensor. Notice how small the lens is compared to your new SLR camera. The tiny lens focusing on a tiny chip results in images that have an infinite depth of field. Your new digital SLR has a larger sensor. The depth of field possible is much closer to what the human eye sees, just like in the old 35mm film cameras. Now we are ready to cover Aperture Priority Auto. For this setting, you will adjust the lens opening and the camera will do the rest. Turn the dial to A and look through the viewfinder. Press the shutter halfway down to focus. On the lower portion of your viewfinder, you'll see shutter and aperture information. This time, turn the subcommand dial to control the aperture value. 
Again, if the aperture meter shows high or low, it indicates a setting that will not produce a properly exposed photo. Simply turn the sub-command dial in the opposite direction. Now, the camera can take a properly exposed photo. There are four factors that determine the depth of field in a photograph. If you understand these, controlling what is in or out of focus will be much easier. You can achieve a shallow depth of field by using an open aperture, by standing close to the subject being photographed, by using a lens with a long focal length, or by using a camera with a large image sensor, as we've discussed before. Pause this presentation now and spend a few minutes with your camera to become familiar with these controls. Come back when you're ready to continue. Why would we use aperture priority? As we discussed previously, aperture is a determining factor in setting the depth of field. Sometimes you want an infinite depth of field or deep focus. Other times you want a shallow depth of field. Your composition, subject matter, and context all play a role in finding the right balance. Experiment with taking photos at different apertures. Here's an example. Have your subject stand about 8 feet in front of a background of plants. Stand about 6 feet from the person and zoom your lens to 100 millimeters. This is often considered a good portrait focal length. Set the mode dial to aperture value and open up the lens using the sub-command dial. Take a photo. Next, dial the aperture closed and take the same photo. How do the two images differ? Not just what is out of focus, but how do you feel about the main subject? Is one photo better than the other? Is one more pleasing to you? We showed you the depth of field preview button earlier in our section on the camera's buttons, but we didn't really explain its use. When you look through the viewfinder, you might expect to see exactly what the image sensor inside the camera sees when you fire off the shutter. Unfortunately, that isn't exactly true. Although you are looking through the lens, the camera leaves the aperture wide open until you snap the photo. This allows you to have a nice, bright view through the viewfinder. Leave the camera on aperture priority setting and use the sub-command dial to close the aperture. The view through the viewfinder does not change. Now, press the depth of field preview button. The camera closes down the aperture to the value you just selected. The viewfinder becomes darker and the depth of field changes. The actual photo won't be this dark, but the depth of field shown to you through the viewfinder is exactly as it will appear on the exposed image. Why do we need to use the depth of field preview button? To see how the exposed image will look, no surprises. The depth of field extends in front of the subject you are taking, as well as behind it. You don't want any unseen object, such as a branch in the foreground, intruding into your composition. And if the background is going to be more in focus than you expected, it may ruin your composition or your reason for taking the photo in the first place. Use the depth of field preview button to compose the best balance between your subject and the background. In this way, you can use the button as a creative aid for better compositions. Let's take a look at Programmed Auto. On Programmed Auto, the camera does its best to adjust the settings, giving you an average exposure. Just as in Auto, the camera chooses the appropriate aperture value and shutter speed. By turning the main command dial, you can extend the usefulness of Programmed Auto. If you turn the main command dial in one direction, the shutter speed becomes faster, while the aperture opens. Turn it in the opposite direction, and the shutter time gets longer as the aperture closes. These combinations are balanced to ensure you will still get a correct exposure. When you are using this flexible option, the letter P and an asterisk will appear in the camera's control panel. You can go back to the default P settings either by turning the main command dial until the P icon disappears or by turning the mode dial. Using P can be a great way to freeze the action or control the depth of field in your image, depending on the situation. As you begin to use these less automated features, you may end up with some images that aren't as clear as you'd like. They may even be blurry. Usually it's not the fault of the camera or lens. It indicates you need a faster shutter speed. 
But what's fast enough to avoid blur? I'm going to give you a quick guideline that works very well. If your camera is not on a tripod, you must shoot with a faster shutter speed than the reciprocal of the focal length. Here's how it works. Say your lens is set to 50 millimeters. You need to shoot faster than 1 over 50 or 1 50th of a second, say 1 60th of a second. If your lens is at 100 millimeters, you must shoot faster than 1 100th of a second, say 1 1 25th of a second. 30 millimeters would mean 1 30th or faster. You may want to pause this presentation and test how well this reciprocal factor works for you. It may change depending on how steady your hands hold the camera. Remember, it's just a guideline. Another way to cut down on shaking is with a special function that may be on your lens. Some companies call this an image stabilization feature. Nikon calls this vibration reduction. It allows you to use a longer zoom lens, shoot under lower light, or with a slower shutter speed and still obtain a clear image. The reciprocal rule begins to break down with lenses over 300 millimeters. This is especially true with non-VR lenses. Try this next demonstration at home. Go outside and tape a newspaper to a wall. Put your camera on a tripod or a flat surface 60 feet from the wall. Zoom into 300 millimeters. To prevent any blurring, I'll shoot with the self timer on. I will also turn on custom setting 31 which delays the shutter release by four tenths of a second. We will cover custom settings in more detail later, but for this experiment, we'll walk you through how to make the setting. Push the menu button and toggle down to the custom settings icon, which looks like a pencil. Use the multi selector to enter the menu and toggle down to number 31. Press OK, select On, and press OK again. Push the menu button twice or press the shutter release once to leave the custom settings menu. Now both the self timer and exposure delay mode are on, making my tripod and my shot as steady as possible. Take your first shot. Now remove the camera from the tripod, hold it up to your eye and shoot your second picture. Look at both photos. If you zoom in, you should be able to read the newspaper in the image you took with the tripod but the image you took while holding the camera is probably blurry. Remember these little tips and you'll be shooting a much higher percentage of sharp shots. You've already learned how to take better photos simply by selecting an exposure mode and turning the command dials. From here, we'll cover the most common setting changes for the D80. Most of these settings are accessed by pushing one of these buttons and then turning the command dial or the subcommand dial. We'll cover the basic controls now. We'll return to some of them later in the advanced section of this presentation. The first setting is the shooting mode, which is selected with a button located on the right of the control panel. This is a toggle control, which means you just keep pushing it until the shooting mode you want appears in the control panel. The choices here are single frame, continuous, self-timer, delayed remote, and quick response remote. The self-timer sets the camera to count down 10 seconds before taking the shot. Besides self-portraits, the self-timer is great for shots on a tripod that require no camera movement. Any static image destined to become a large print might be a candidate for the self-timer. Most new owners of the D80 either choose single frame or continuous shooting. For continuous, the camera fires off up to three shots per second as long as the shutter release is held down. We've discussed using focus areas and letting the camera decide where to focus. But how do you decide when to focus? You may be taking a portrait of someone standing completely still. Or you may be at the zoo where an animal's movement is unpredictable. The D80 has a setting for each of these situations, and one for everything in between. You'll find the autofocus button on the top of the camera below the shooting mode button. This is a toggle control as well. Pushing the button will bring up one of three options in the control panel. The first we'll consider is single servo AF. Single servo freezes the focus when you press the shutter release halfway down. 
If a proper focus is obtained, the in-focus indicator will appear in the viewfinder and the camera sounds a soft beep. This setting is good for stationary subjects like portraits or buildings. The second option we'll cover is called Continuous Servo AF. With this setting, the camera will continue to search for the correct focus behind the selected focus bracket until the shutter button is released. The in-focus indicator does not need to be visible in the viewfinder for you to take a photo. This setting is great for constantly moving subjects like small children or animals. Finally, there is Auto Select. Here, the camera chooses the autofocus mode depending on the situation. If the subject is stationary, the camera selects single servo. But if the subject moves, the camera switches to continuous. When shooting in auto select, the in focus indicator must be visible for you to take the photo. Auto select is really the best of all the options. Unless continuous servo is absolutely necessary, you can just let the camera change from single to continuous as needed. Now, let's go down the back of the camera to the button labeled ISO. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, you'll want to set the ISO after evaluating how much ambient light is at your location. On a film camera, ISO refers to film speed. This, of course, is a digital camera. There is no film. The designers of all digital cameras decided to use this convention from the film world to describe electronic sensor gain. This is when the camera artificially amplifies the signal to obtain a clear image. Many of you have made video tapes with a consumer video camera in extremely low light situations. Images on the tape can be seen, but the overall quality of the video tape is not very good. The image is captured by electronically enhancing the sensor. There are two methods for selecting your own ISO. First, you can push the ISO button on the back of the camera and turn the main command dial. The ISO speeds will appear on the control panel. If you are new to ISO, we'll keep it simple for now. If you are inside or taking sports shots with faster shutter speeds, set the ISO to 200 or 400. For outdoor photography on a sunny day, set it to 100. For photos taken at night, especially in a poorly lit room, you'll need a high ISO, like 800. The second way to set the ISO is to go into the shooting menu on the monitor. Here, you can select the ISO speed that's right for the current lighting conditions. Or, if you're shooting in one of the Digital Vary programs, you can turn the ISO to Auto. Now, the camera will increase the amplification, or ISO, if it determines that there is not enough light for the current setting. While we're here in the shooting menu, I want to take a moment to point out a very handy feature of the D80. It's the Help button. Push this button while in the menu system and the camera will bring up a help screen explaining what the particular function or menu is for. This can be a great resource when you are still learning all the settings on the camera. We started with ISO for a reason. ISO works together with shutter speed and aperture to create a proper exposure. Think of these three elements as a triangle. As you increase ISO, it allows you to shoot with a faster shutter speed or with a closed down aperture. Slowing down the shutter allows you to use a lower ISO speed or a more closed aperture. Pulling on one of these elements pushes the other two. The camera software makes the adjustments automatically to create a correct exposure, especially in auto ISO. You change an element for a specific quality and the camera compensates by adjusting one or both of the other settings. Just below ISO is a button marked Qual. Press the button and turn the main command dial to change the image quality and size. Choices include whether to shoot RAW, also known as NEF files, or to shoot JPEG files. With JPEG files, you have a choice of how much compression to apply. Fine applies very little compression, approximately 4 to 1, while Basic applies quite a bit, on the order of 16 to 1. In addition, the JPEG settings allow you to choose the size or number of pixels represented in the resulting file. Here, the choices are small, medium, or large. 
Large will save a JPEG that is more than 3800 pixels wide. Small results in a JPEG image that is more than 1900 pixels wide. Use the subcommand dial to pick the size of your JPEG image. Shooting in RAW gives you the maximum flexibility when editing your photo because it preserves the most original data. This can be especially important if you print your photos in a larger format. When you shoot in JPEG, all the tonal qualities of the image like sharpness, contrast, exposure and color temperature are applied when the exposure is made and the image is compressed and saved on the card. With RAW, all the data is stored as it's recorded on the sensor, with the tonal properties stored off to the side. When you open your RAW files with your image processing program, you apply the tonal properties you want and adjust the image. These adjustments won't cause you to lose data. RAW images store 12 bits of data for each pixel, instead of 8 bits for JPEG images. This may be most important to you in high contrast images like this one where you want to retain the details in the bright clouds but still be able to see into the shadows. We have already covered a lot of ground in this presentation. The advanced section will build on this foundation. Feel free to take a break now and experiment with your camera. When you come back, we'll discuss the tenets of good photo composition. As photographers, our goal is to convey our personal outlook and view of the world in the form of photographs. Good photographic composition can help you express your visual ideas. Following the guidelines of composition won't guarantee award-winning photos, but I can promise you this, your shooting will improve. I am not asking you to memorize the rules and follow them by rote. Good photographers sometimes break the rules, but they know why and they do it for a reason. You probably have a friend or a relative who always seems to have a stack of vacation or holiday snapshots. In every batch, there may be one or two interesting shots, but the rest are pretty boring. Most people simply don't know how to make their photos interesting. They don't know how to arrange their subjects and backgrounds in an appealing way. That's what we're going to discuss now. The principles of good composition can be learned. As you look at a potential shot through the viewfinder, move the camera around to find the best image. Don't forget to zoom with your feet. Moving a short distance can sometimes make all the difference. Here is a concept that will help you find the best arrangement of elements. It's called the rule of thirds and has been used by artists for hundreds of years. Divide the horizontal plane and the vertical plane into thirds. The intersections of these lines are the best places to locate important subjects. If you have a subject with prominent lines or edges, such as a building or a seascape, place them along the rule of thirds lines. A few words about horizons. Never allow the horizon to cross the image plane exactly in the middle. If you want to feature a subject that lies above the horizon, such as a beautiful sunset, place the horizon lower than the center line. If your main area of interest is below the horizon, arrange the shot so that the horizon is higher than the center line. Teach yourself to visualize the thirds when you are looking at photographs and artwork. You will notice that professional photographers use this concept all the time. You will see the rule of thirds in television commercials, movies, and documentaries. A problem with so many snapshots is that the people are so tiny you can hardly tell who they are. The photographers tried to cram a lot of information about who and where into one photograph. It doesn't work. The solution is to get specific with your framing. Fill up the viewfinder with the important stuff the people, and enough of the surrounding details to identify the location. Then take additional photos to explore the place, the view, the architecture, the food. A photograph, like a painting or a drawing, is a two-dimensional object. The big issue facing photographers is this. How do you depict the three-dimensional world on two-dimensional paper? How do you avoid a flat look to your photos? There are things that you can do to help the viewer see the third dimension. Rule number one, you must understand the technical aspects of focusing your camera. 
Focus is the most important component of making a good photograph. The sharp edges and clarity of the focus subject engage the eye of the viewer. To make your area of sharp focus more forceful, contrast it against an area of softer focus. To control the line between sharp and soft focused, you must understand depth of field and put it to work in your images. The contrast of a sharply focused subject against a soft background will greatly intensify the illusion of three dimensions. A few more tips that add depth. If possible, take advantage of overlapping objects. Overlaps show that one object is in front of another object in space. Use this trick to give your photographs the feeling of space and depth in the real world. Elements of perspective can be used to enhance the third dimension. Things like a line of fence posts going away from you, or a row of arches in a building, or a road winding off into the distance. Buildings can be a great source of perspective clues. Look at what happens with walls and roof lines as they rise up and away from you. These are all indications that the scene has space and depth. We have talked about a number of things that you can do to improve your photographs through composition. We talked about the rule of thirds, which help you place your subject in the photographic plane. We talked about sharp and soft focus, and discussed ways to create depth and space. We have only begun to touch on the subject of photographic composition. If you'd like to find out more, complete books on the subject are available. Use these guidelines and you'll be thinking about photographs in a new way. Another key element of composition is your lens. The lens you choose can enhance emotion or create a new perspective for your images. Do you want to add character to your subject's face or create depth between your subject and the background? Your lens selection will contribute to the result. Here's an example. Have your subject stand about 15 feet in front of an interesting background. Use your wide-angle lens to take a photograph. Now, look at the results. See how the lens has created depth? The background looks as if it's dozens of feet behind her instead of several feet. The wider the lens, the more you see this effect. Use a focal length of about 50 millimeters to create depth that matches what your eyes see. Get ready for the second part of the lens test by putting a telephoto lens on your camera. Frame the subject for your shot the same way you did with your wide angle lens. Now, let's compare the results. Where the wide angle lens emphasized the distance between your subject and the background, the telephoto lens flattened out the scene, essentially stacking things up against each other. The subject looks like she's standing right next to the background and can simply turn around and touch it. This example shows you how a lens can change the perception of the third dimension and the feeling of intimacy you have with the subject. Your choice of lens can lend character to your subject as well. Let's go back to our model. Remember how her features looked with the wide angle lens? It sharpened every feature and it emphasized every flaw. If accentuating the character of your subject is your goal, the wide angle lens is a great choice. However, if you are doing fashion photography, you might want to go a little more telephoto with your lens selection. We're going to cover several topics in this section that will build on what you've already learned. Don't worry if this section doesn't make total sense now. Many of the advanced features will be things you grow into after you've mastered the basics. Shoot with your camera for a while, come back and review this section in a few weeks. I guarantee all the pieces will fall into place. White balance is a topic that can either be very simple or a little more involved based on your needs as a photographer. Happily, the D80 gives you white balance settings that work well under a variety of conditions. First, a short explanation of color temperature. When we shoot photographs, we can have a variety of light sources, each with its own characteristics. Color temperature refers to the spectrum of visible light illuminating an object. We refer to the measurement of the light spectrum with something called Kelvin temperature. Kelvin temperature refers to the color given off by carbon when it's heated to a specific temperature. At 2000 degrees centigrade, carbon glows red, 
but when it's heated to 5600 degrees, it is white hot. Take the sun for instance. When it's shining directly overhead, we perceive white daylight. The Earth's atmosphere allows the entire visible spectrum of light to pass through and illuminate our world, resulting in a higher color temperature, about 5200 degrees Kelvin. An hour after sunrise, or an hour before sunset, the curvature of the Earth and the atmosphere restrict the amount of light that can reach us. When the sun is low above the horizon, the atmosphere scatters short wavelength colors, such as blue and violet. But long wavelength colors, such as red and yellow, come to us through the atmosphere, creating a more golden colored light. In this case, the color temperature is lower, about 2900 degrees. We've all seen a red sunset, or the golden light that is so beautiful an hour before the sun goes down. The light given off by incandescent bulbs is similar to the light we see an hour before sunset. Candlelight is more extreme. It's very red, with a very low color temperature. Think of how your friends look sitting in front of a fireplace. Firelight is about 1900 degrees Kelvin. We're not talking about the intensity of the light, but rather the composition of the light spectrum. Most of the time, we want to represent the true color of something. We want the people in our photographs to have natural skin tones. The D80 has many settings for white balance. Each is designed to compensate for a specific light source. Let's look at auto white balance first. In this setting, the camera meters the light coming through the lens and compensates for the color temperature being recorded. The auto white balance causes the exposure to appear as if it was made under natural sunlight. In cloudy daylight conditions, the clouds actually block out some of the longer waves, resulting in a color temperature higher or bluer than bright sunlight. Shady conditions usually have a higher color temperature, about 8000 degrees. Auto white balance filters out the blue, shifting the colors back toward the red and yellow range. If you are shooting indoors under incandescent light or firelight, the auto white balance shifts the camera back toward the blue range. This shift results in skin tones that look natural. If you want this natural sunlight look, the auto white balance setting does a remarkable job. For many photographers, this is a setting that never gets changed. But you can use the optional white balance values like fluorescent or direct sunlight to create better photographs before you upload the images into your computer. Let's say you're taking a walk just before sunset. The light is making everything a beautiful golden color. The shadows are fantastic. If you're shooting JPEG images in auto white balance, the camera will shift everything toward blue to compensate for the yellow-orange light. Then it will compress your image and store it on your SD card. That beautiful light is gone. You can use software to shift the color back toward the yellow-orange range later, but it's work that can be avoided. You will also lose data from your original image. Why? The program you use to shift the colors will compress your JPEG file a second time, discarding more of the original data. You may decide to print this photo, but you've already given data away twice. If you set the white balance correctly at the time you take the photo, you won't have to spend time fixing it later. In order to understand exactly what the white balance setting does, we have to do a little experiment. Go outside on a bright day and pick a subject to photograph. Now, push the white balance button on the back of the camera and turn the main command dial until the control panel reads K for Kelvin temperature. Use the subcommand dial to set the Kelvin temperature to 2500 degrees. Take eight photos of the same subject, increasing the Kelvin temperature by about 1000 degrees between shots. Review all eight photos on your computer. As you scroll through the images, you will notice the color changes from severely blue at 2500 degrees Kelvin to a warm, almost orange hue at 9900 degrees Kelvin. But wait, doesn't a lower Kelvin temperature indicate a more red light? Shouldn't the setting of 2500 degrees be more orange than blue? You have to think about it backwards. The camera shifts the color toward the blue side because it expected the photo to be taken under the equivalent of firelight. Since you took this picture outdoors under a sunny sky, there was already a lot of blue light. 
Conversely, a setting of 9900 degrees is going to reduce the blue spectrum and leave our shot with an overabundance of orange and yellow hues. So, you can select the Kelvin temperature based on the shooting conditions, or choose one of the situation specific values in the control panel. Each is configured to compensate for the light spectrum present. Despite all these choices, you may wish to fine tune the setting to get a more pleasing color or skin tone. The D80 allows you to shift the white balance, making your image a little warmer or cooler. You can access white balance shift by pressing the WB button and turning the subcommand dial. You may find that people look more attractive when the image is slightly warm. This fine tuning can be used with any of the white balance settings except K and white balance preset. White balance preset allows you to set the white balance manually. Many owners of the D80 will never use this feature, but you should know why it's important. If you are going to be shooting indoors and there are different light sources illuminating your subjects, you may find that the auto white balance setting will not produce accurate colors. And since daylight varies in color temperature based on the position of the sun in the sky, a sunlight white balance setting won't be correct either. Rather than color correct all the photos after they're in your computer, you may elect to use white balance preset. This will give you true colors under any lighting conditions, whether you want accurate skin tones, are shooting product photos, or just wish to avoid color correcting later. You can set the manual white balance in one of two ways. The most common is through a process Nikon calls direct measurement. Press the WB button and turn the main command dial until the presetting appears in the control panel. Next, release the WB button, then quickly press it again and hold until the word pre starts to flash. Now, point the camera toward a white object or neutral gray card. Press the shutter release. The camera does not record a picture, but it does measure the current color temperature. If the camera was able to accurately measure the light and determine white balance settings, the word good will flash on the control panel and the letters GD will flash in the viewfinder. You are now ready to take correctly white balance photos under these lighting conditions. The second method involves the use of the shooting menu and selecting the white balance properties from an existing photograph on the SD card. Use the multi selector to highlight use photo and then select image. Use the multi selector again or turn the main command dial to highlight the image you want and push the OK button. The D80's custom settings menu allows you to take the decision of where to focus beyond the selection of a focus area bracket. Custom setting 2, called AF Area Mode, lets you decide how the focus area is selected in autofocus. Here, your choices are single area AF, dynamic area AF, and auto area AF. Let's look at dynamic area first. This can be used with continuous servo AF to capture photos of moving subjects. Dynamic area allows the camera to maintain a proper focus, even if your subject leaves the selected focus area. The camera tracks the subject and focuses based on information from other focus areas. This can be especially useful for photos of pets, small children, or sporting events where your subject may not be the closest object to the lens. Your other choices under Custom Setting 2 are Auto Area, which turns control over to the camera, and Single Area. Single Area is best for stationary objects. The camera will only focus on whatever is behind the area bracket you select. One interesting feature of the single and dynamic area options is they allow you more flexibility in the digital vary programs. When AF area is set to auto, the camera selects the focus area, regardless of the exposure setting. Auto is also the default setting for all the digital vary programs except sports and macro. However, by switching to single or dynamic area, you can decide for yourself where the camera will focus in any of the advanced exposures or digital vary programs. One caution, however, setting the AF area on single or dynamic is just temporary in the digital vary programs. While the setting will remain in effect if you turn the camera off, 
it will revert back to its default setting once you turn the mode dial. The same is not true for the advanced exposures. Whether you turn the camera off or switch between modes, the AF area setting you select will remain in effect. That is why the first custom setting option, Reset, is so important. Use the Reset option to restore the camera to factory defaults. Remember, this reset only affects the custom setting menu, not the controls. Custom setting 3 can also impact where the camera focuses. In normal frame, the camera focuses on the subject behind the narrow brackets. Wide frame increases the area around the center bracket, allowing the camera to track moving subjects. You may find that wide area AF works well for you regardless of the situation. In some situations, for instance with extremely backlit subjects, you may wish to lock the focus and or exposure. We will talk about exposure metering in a few minutes, but first let's look at the A lock, AF lock button on the back of the camera. The default setting for this button allows you to lock the exposure before taking a photo. This may be necessary when your subject is backlit or in high contrast situations. Let's look at an example where you might want to use AE AF lock. Here we have a backlit subject, but just out of frame we have a fairly neutral scene without backlighting. If we lock the exposure on an area of the frame without backlighting, then reframe the subject, the camera will expose it correctly. The background may be blown out, as it is in this photo, but the subject you wish to shoot will be exposed correctly. You can also reprogram the AEAF lock button to initiate autofocus. This feature is called AF on. It not only reassigns autofocusing to the AEAF lock button, it also disables the autofocus function in the shutter button. The result is a camera that allows you to take image after image without stopping to refocus between shots. To engage this option, go to number 18 on your custom settings menu and use the multi selector to toggle down to AF on. Push OK. Now you can only use AF on to focus. If the camera is set on dynamic area AF, it will not track your subject and refocus. We'll cover other ways to lock exposure and focus when we come back to the custom settings later in the presentation. Metering refers to how the camera sets the exposure for your photo. Here's a photograph I took of a polar bear eating a vanilla ice cream cone in the middle of a blizzard. This shot of bats in a cave on Borneo was taken without a flash in the middle of the night. And this is my favorite. I call it a sunny day in London. Of course I'm just kidding, but I'm doing it to make a point. An interesting photograph has highlights, shadows, and midtones. When the camera meters the frame, for instance in the matrix setting, the most important thing it does is determine what value in the frame is a midtone. It averages the frame and comes up with an exposure that it thinks will create a photo with a good balance of midtones highlights and shadows. Set your preference by pushing the meter button and turning the main command dial. In the control panel you will see three options matrix, center weighted metering and spot metering. The default setting is matrix. In this setting the entire frame is evaluated and an average exposure is taken to capture as many highlights and shadows as possible. Now, it's true that matrix measures distance, colors, and contrast. All these things are important, but the primary thing metering does is to determine how dark or light the frame is and how to create an exposure where you can see as much detail as possible. The next setting is center weighted. The camera will still look at the entire frame, but will consider the area in the center of the frame to be the most important. The last option is spot metering. Here, the camera uses a tiny percentage of the frame for its measurement, centered on the active focus area bracket. If the camera is set on auto area AF, then it will use the very center of the frame for the spot metering measurement. So in situations of extreme backlighting, high contrast, or multiple light sources, you can use spot metering to ensure that your subject will be properly exposed. 
Simply meter on the subject in the frame you consider to have a middle value. Many advanced photographers use center-weighted metering as their default choice. They lock the focus and metering by pressing the AEAF lock button, reframe their photo, and take the picture. You may ask why focusing and metering are in the advanced section. As we've already seen, these settings are not particularly hard to understand. But step back for a moment and look at all the controls together. These are tools that will work together to give you the best exposure. Single servo AF or continuous AF, focus area selection, metering, and focus and exposure lock. You won't need them all the time, but understanding how they work will make the D80 a more versatile tool when you are faced with unusual lighting. Typically, exposure compensation is used when the subject is either much brighter or much darker than the background. First, make sure your camera is on any one of the advanced exposure settings, except for manual. Exposure compensation is available in manual, but it works differently than for the other advanced exposure modes. We'll explain why in our section on manual. For now, hold down the exposure compensation button and turn the main command dial. Moving the dial to the left will overexpose the image, while going to the right will underexpose it. It's important to remember the exposure compensation you set will remain in effect regardless of whether you switch to another of the advanced exposures or turn the camera off. You must either return the exposure compensation to zero or reset the camera. Bracketing is a carryover from the film days when you couldn't instantly check to make sure you got the shot. Exposure bracketing allows you to take multiple shots with different under and over exposure settings. Push the BKT button to engage bracketing and turn the main command dial to choose the number of shots and the bracketing program. Now turn the sub command dial to set the bracketing increments and values from one third to two EV steps. To cancel bracketing, push the BKT button and turn the main command dial until the bracketing sequence reads zero. In most cases, you can use the tools we've already discussed such as center weighted metering and spot metering to ensure your subject is properly exposed. But if it's the shot of a lifetime, you may want to bracket just to make sure you get the best image possible. You can also bracket for white balance. This is one of the four options available under custom setting 13 for auto bracket. When bracketing for white balance, the camera stores multiple copies of each image that is exposed with the shutter release. The images will range from cool to warm based on how the bracket program is set with the two command dials. Many digital photographers never use bracketing. They feel the photos they take can be manipulated well enough using the image processing programs on their computer. If you choose full manual, the camera gives you control over the aperture and shutter. Turning the main command dial in manual mode changes the shutter speed, just like in shutter priority auto. To change the aperture, turn the sub command dial just as you would in aperture priority auto. Having control of both shutter speed and aperture can be useful if you're trying to achieve a specific effect, or if you have lighting situations that require manual underexposure to retain details. You can use exposure compensation to achieve an under or overexposed image in manual. This process is a little different than in other exposure modes, so we will walk you through it. First, set your shutter speed and aperture for a correct exposure. Next, set your exposure compensation value. Let's say you want to underexpose this image by two EV steps. Now, look through the viewfinder. The exposure indicator is showing overexposure bars along the left side. Think of these bars as guidelines that tell you how much you'll need to change the shutter speed or aperture size in order to achieve an underexposed image. Set a faster shutter speed or close down the aperture until the exposure indicator level returns to zero. The camera is now set to take a photo that is underexposed by two EV steps. The tools we just covered, metering, AE lock, exposure compensation, bracketing, and manual all do one thing, 
each in a very different way. They allow you, as the photographer, to override the exposure the camera would normally select. Do you remember how we said that there were four steps to taking great photos? Well, actually, there are five. Reviewing your work and making adjustments is the last step after four, the shot. Talk to any professional photographer and he will tell you that most of their photos are discarded. They may be out of focus, they may have a bad exposure, or they may have something in the frame the photographer didn't see. Nikon has given you a big and beautiful display monitor on the back of your camera, allowing you to check your images immediately before you move on to another scene. Review your photos and then you can make instant adjustments to get exactly the shot you want. You can look at your photo for a few seconds immediately after taking it or access the whole SD card full of images by pressing playback. First, we'll review the single image playback features. The most recent photo appears on the monitor. Use the multi-selector left and right keys to proceed through the stored images. By examining the last image you took, or the last series of images, you'll get valuable information on how your exposure settings are working. When the full image is displayed, you will see a minimal amount of information displayed along the top and bottom edges. Pushing the multi-selector up and down arrows, or turning the sub-command dial, will bring up more information, including two pages of image details and a retouching history. The fourth page will show you if any areas of your photo are overexposed. All the details in the blinking areas are blown out. Finally, the fifth display page brings up four histograms. The main histogram, at the bottom left, will show you whether your image has good tonal definition and if your exposure is indeed right for your subject. The histogram, in this case, will look like a bell curve, with most of the data in the middle. The RGB histogram shows the same information broken out into red, green, and blue channels. This can be handy, especially when taking photos where the object has a dominant color, like these red flowers. Just remember, all the information on these displays is there to support your decision of whether the image looks good. That's what really matters. If you like the way the exposure looks now, you'll probably like it later. You can zoom into a photo by pressing the playback zoom, which functions as the call button as well. Push the button multiple times to increase the magnification. Use the multi-selector to move around the image. If you want to see more images while still zoomed in, just turn the main command dial. Push the shutter release or playback button if you want to go back to taking photos. Or push the thumbnail button until the image zooms out. Now the camera is back on single image playback. From here you can press the thumbnail button to bring up four or nine thumbnail images. Use the multi-selector to move through and select any image. If you don't like what you see, delete the image by pressing the delete key twice. This option is available in any playback mode. You may save an image from deletion by pushing the protect key. This will prevent deletion until you reformat the SD card. Here's one more helpful option. This camera has the ability to sense how you're holding it when you take a shot. You can set up the camera to automatically rotate a portrait image when transferring it to your computer. Access the Setup menu, select Auto Image Rotation, and select On. If you also want to see the image rotated in playback, there's a setting for that too. Go to the Playback menu, select the Rotate Tall option, and turn it on. Now the camera will rotate portrait images and thumbnails. The built-in flash can be a great tool for increasing the quality of your photographs under a variety of lighting conditions. We can configure the flash unit to enhance our subjects, rather than giving us the typical blown out flash look we've all seen in snapshots. Many digital point and shoot cameras use a simple flash system with an underpowered light. Fire off the flash on the D80 and you'll notice something different if you watch the flash closely. The flash fires twice. The D80 sends the first flash out and meters the light through the lens. It then compensates with the second flash while exposing the photo. 
Most beginning photographers use the flash on their camera when they are indoors under low light. Here's a tip. Use your flash outside under bright sunny skies. The flash will fill in some of the harsh shadows created by the sun. Another good use for your flash is to illuminate a backlit subject. Rather than using exposure compensation and blowing out the details in the background, add some light to the subject with the built-in flash. The D80 allows you to configure both the intensity and the timing of the flash. Let's look at flash compensation first. Press the flash compensation button on the front of the camera. Turn the sub command dial to decrease the flash intensity up to 3 EV steps. The result will be a typical fill flash. Rotate the sub command dial in the other direction and the flash intensity will increase by up to 1 EV step. Slow sync is a topic that a lot of amateur photographers don't really understand. Let's look at how this works. In this simulation, we're looking at the closed shutter in front of the image sensor. When the shutter is fired, the front curtain is lowered to allow the focused image to be recorded on the image sensor. Just to make it simple, we're showing the image right side up. Once the shutter time has elapsed, the rear curtain lowers to cover up the image sensor. So far, pretty simple. Next, we have a situation that requires a flash. There are some lights in the background, but our subject is too dark. The camera determines how long the shutter has to stay open to properly expose the background. Let's say in this case, the shutter time is one quarter of a second. Pretty slow, right? The front curtain opens and the image sensor begins to collect light for the background exposure. The flash fires and exposes our foreground subject in just a few milliseconds. The flash is not powerful enough to reach the landscape in the background, so it stays dark. But the shutter is still open. The flash is turned off, so the objects in the foreground are in the dark again. If the subject moves a little, there is so little light in the foreground that the image sensor cannot really see or record it. The background, however, continues to give off enough light to expose the image on the sensor. The shutter time has elapsed and the rear curtain closes. And that is a slow sync exposure. The slow shutter speed allows the background to be exposed, but the blast of light from the speed light freezes the subject in the foreground within the few milliseconds that the flash tube is activated. Since the flash fires and shuts off in just milliseconds, it can be set to fire just after the front curtain is completely open, or just before the rear curtain starts to close. We've all seen examples of taillights streaming behind a car. The auto looks like it's driving away. The flash freezes the car just at the end of the exposure. The taillights expose on the image sensor, but the car is frozen just before the rear curtain closes. In contrast, if the auto is frozen at the beginning of the exposure, the result is the car that looks like it's backing up. The default on the D80 is front curtain sync. With the exception of the example we just reviewed, you will rarely or never use rear curtain sync. Press the flash button and rotate the main command dial to configure any of the five flash sync modes. Anytime you see slow in the flash area of the control panel, it indicates a flash designed for slow sync exposure. The auto icon plus flash icon indicates the camera will fire the flash as needed. But if the word auto is not visible, then the flash will only fire if you push the flash button first. Turn on AE bracketing with the speed light extended and the camera will bracket for flash. This can be a quick way to ensure you have a usable image while adding flash. The D80's custom settings allow you to adjust the camera to perfectly fit your shooting style. We will take a condensed look at these settings because you will not need all of them to customize the camera. We have already covered much of what you truly need to shoot great photos. Many of the custom settings are very simple they turn a function either on or off. For example, custom setting 6 allows you to turn off image review, 
meaning the image you just took won't appear in the monitor unless you push playback. Turning on custom setting 7 allows the camera to take over the ISO setting. If you turn on ISO Auto, the camera will step in and adjust the ISO sensitivity if the current settings won't create a correct exposure. You can set limits on this function through the maximum sensitivity setting. This function lets you set the highest speed for ISO Auto. You can also tell the camera to only change the ISO setting if the resulting image would be underexposed at a minimum shutter speed. This function is available in Programmed Auto and Aperture Priority Auto. Custom setting 8 turns on a grid display in the viewfinder, which can help you line up your shot. This is especially useful for lining up building edges and horizons. As we mentioned earlier, custom setting 13 allows you to turn on white balance bracketing. In this setting, each time you take a photo, up to three images will be recorded, each with its own white balance setting. Custom setting 13 gives you three other options as well. The default setting will bracket exposure and flash together. You can also choose to bracket just the exposure or bracket the flash levels. Another useful option is custom setting 16, which allows you to program a button on the front of the camera. We're going to explain two of the functions for custom setting 16. One that will help anyone new to SLR cameras and the other for intermediate users. Earlier, when we first tried the function button, it brought up a display of the current ISO setting. This can be helpful when you're shooting in the field and aren't sure if the current ISO setting will match the lighting conditions. A photographer with more intermediate skills might assign spot metering to the function button. This option is especially helpful if you prefer center weighted metering, but frequently find yourself switching to spot metering. Custom setting 16 has 9 options in all. We recommend you look them over and see which function will help you the most. If you use the AE lock and AF lock button a lot, you'll want to review custom settings 18 and 19. Custom setting 18 allows you to configure how the shutter release and AE AF lock work together. We have already covered option 5, which lets you use the AE AF lock button to focus the camera. But with this setting, you can also program the AE AF lock button to lock only the exposure or the focus alone. Now, look at the focus area selection option. This setting is key to understanding the last four options under custom setting 18. It programs the AE AF lock button to act only as a focus area selector. Hold down the button and turn the sub-command dial to move between focus brackets. This may be easier to use than the multi-selector. Now, look at the last four options. They are just like the first four, only they let you use AE AF lock as both a lock button and as a focus area selector. Push the button to lock the exposure or focus, depending on the setting. Then, you can turn the sub-command dial to set a new focus area. Custom setting 19 allows you to add the AE lock function to your shutter release, cutting down once more on your button pushes. The default mode here is off. When the function is on, lock the current exposure by pushing the shutter release halfway down. Then you can reframe your subject if needed and take the shot. Review all the custom settings after you get comfortable with your D80. You may find that some of the settings will really help simplify the whole process for you. But as I said before, if you never change the custom settings, you can still take stunning photos. We've had a chance to scroll through several of the menu screens by now. As you may have noticed, there are a lot of them. But there doesn't have to be. Nikon has added an option called My Menu under the set of menus. This allows you to decide which screens are displayed. Highlight My Menu and press the multi-selector to begin the setup. For each menu, highlight the information pages you would like to see and press OK to confirm. Highlight Done and then press OK to finish the menu setup. The camera stores your selections and sets up your personal menu. If you don't want to set up your own menu, but don't want all the options displayed either, you can select Simple View. Full view will display all custom and setup menu choices. We 
have covered many of the menu options available on the D80. Now is your opportunity to review the rest and see how they could apply to your shooting style. One option you may want to explore is the retouch menu. Most photographers edit their images on the computer before printing. But if you plan to print directly from the camera, these functions could be helpful. Try delighting to brighten the shadowy areas while maintaining the highlights in your photographs. Trim lets you crop and reposition your photos before printing. You probably won't need these features for everyday shooting, but they could come in handy now and then. The D80 is powered by a small lithium ion battery. This is a powerful battery that holds a large charge. You may have purchased a spare. That was a good idea. Just be sure to always carry the spare battery with its protective plastic cover in place. Any metal object that touches the exposed contacts can start a fire. And that is not a good idea. Here's one more thing you'll find useful. Blue Crane Digital makes a laminated reference card for the D80 that you can carry in your bag. It's color coded so you can find the answers to your questions quickly. It's called InBrief. If your local camera store doesn't carry it, they can order one for you. During the course of this presentation, we have demonstrated the important features and settings of the D80 and how they can help you take fantastic photos. But to truly understand how this camera works, you need to experiment. So set up your camera on a tripod, arrange a still life to photograph, and take a series of photos on a variety of settings so you can see for yourself how they impact your photos. A good place to start is with the Optimize Image Settings in the Shooting menu. These settings allow you to change the contrast, sharpness, saturation, and hue of your image. Select Custom and go through each option. Take a separate photo for each setting, whether you're going from low to high or from negative to positive as in the case of the hue adjustments. Here is one hint that will make this demonstration more valuable. When choosing the subject to photograph, include at least one item with vivid colors and something that has text printed on it. The differences in hue and saturation will be more noticeable with bright colors, and the text will help you see the differences between low and high image sharpening. Well, that's it. We hope this introduction to using the D80 will help you take the best images possible. Some of the topics in this presentation may not seem important to you yet. But use the camera for a while. As you become more comfortable with the D80, you'll find yourself taking better photos than you ever imagined. You'll also see situations that are addressed in the advanced topics of this presentation. Refer to this presentation anytime you want. Thanks for watching. Now go out and take some great photos. Mm -hmm.